people. This is Wade Hood, and because of all this COVID stuff, I haven't been able to meet with people, so I'm putting all my stuff online on my YouTube channel, and um, some of you have seen this before. I'm going to quickly go through the math, but the math, but this video is going to be mainly on the science, and I'm going to append it to the test BO4 to use these tips to go over the science test. So I'm going to, you can pause this video, pause, pause, and read through the math stuff, but I'm going to look at the science. Okay, if, if you've heard me before, I'm going to say the science is not strictly a science test. It's how fast you can read and interpret data. And just like the reading section of the ACT, it's a, for most people, it's a good tip. Do not read the entire passages. Scan the paragraphs to get the vocabulary, then go right to the questions. Um, I've noticed a trend in the last couple of years. They have the varying viewpoints, scientist one, scientist two, or student one, student two, student three, where they have like three things to look at. But a lot of the questions are still read the figures, especially question one. Question one, passage one is usually a very simple passage and then passages two three four five and they get more advanced as we go along and you'll see that in the later in the video so go right to scan the passage look at the figures and then see look at see figure one on table three and typically if you have six questions on each passage you roughly the first two are easy and the last two are harder they they incorporate looking at two or three graphs so number two look at the figures tables and graphs what are the trends what are the relationships are they a direct relationship where it's going up? Is it an inverse relationship where it's going down? Or is there no relationship at all? What are the highest and lowest? What are the averages? What are the trends? Those are the kind of questions that will be asked. And be sure to look at units because that'll help you figure out is this percent? Is this uh, grams per milliliter density? You know, look at the right chart. So looking at the units, and I know your science teacher, if you had a good one, said, well, watch your units all the time. That's all I tell my students, and they rarely listen to me, but some of them do. Number three, like I said before, this is not strictly a science test. It's more of a data analysis test, and how fast you can read graphs, tables, and charts and interpret data quickly. In Texas, there's a UIL contest in middle school called Maps, Graphs, and Charts. That's exactly what this is. So if, you've, if you knew that, you've seen a lot of that before. Then number four, most passages have easy questions, and then they have hard questions. So you want to get to all the passages. So like a lot of the other tests, it's a time management. So if there's 40 questions in 35 minutes, that's roughly a minute of question. So at question 20, you should be at minute 17. And your timer, which you cannot use a outside timer, but you must have an old timey watch. Just an old, not a, not a smart watch, a dumb watch. You need a watch where you can watch the time and that's it. So be sure to use a use a phone timer while you're practicing, but you need to invest in a just a cheap Casio watch like I'm wearing on well actually it's by my desk right now because I am wearing my smart watch. Sorry. So I can count my steps as I mow and walk and stuff. But I have a just a plain Casio cheapy watch that I use to paint when I paint people's houses. Okay. So sorry for the digression. But you want to get the easy questions, so you need to be sure you do read each passage. So if you're on the last passage, maybe questions 35 and 36 are easy, but questions 39 and 40 are hard. And this it's kind of like beauty's in the eye of the beholder. There's some people that I'm like, this question's so easy, and they didn't see it. And there's like, I saw this one, like, man, this would take a long time, and people saw it differently. So what you need is to take three or four tests to get the practice. And I think following these rules... These little guidelines will help you get through those quicker. Okay, let's go to the next test. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <clears throat> okay, this is science test B04 from April 2019. And this is during the COVID epidemic. This is actually July of 2020 right now. And what I would have would like to have been doing is taking another test from either the April or June administration and working through it, but this is one of the last tests I have to work through. Uh, it's just a piece of random stuff. Okay, if you have not taken this test and you're looking at it right now, I'm going to let you pause this video. Beep, 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 beep. Okay, now you can pause and look at all these, um, pat this passage one, 
and I'm gonna make a couple of notes about this. Experiment one, um, there's, there's gonna be some stuff that says one hour, and it's wild caught H. pyrithic spiders. Experiment two, using the same set of 100 wild caught spiders, and then it's one hour as well. And then there's some more data, and look at the highs and lows. Then experiment three is with 100 laboratory raised spiders. So there will be some questions about the types of spiders and crickets and stuff like that. So we'll go to the questions in a moment. But before I do anything else, I'm gonna look at some data. Okay, looking at this figure, the highest is blue and blue is still the highest here and blue is still the highest here. So that will probably be a question. And the lowest was um, green in this one and red and yellow here, red and yellow here. So if they ask about it, uh, that'd be a, one of the questions. So the high, low trends and averages will be a question. Let me scroll up to the questions. So you can pause this and read this a little bit faster. So number one, if it says two hours, well, doesn't that make sense that if, there's, if you have more time, you're gonna eat more spiders, eat more, the spiders eat more crickets. So only C and D work and it's two times, not three times. And looking back, it's like, wow, that was a very simple question the way they asked it. So I, I want you to have the experience of the first time you do, you might be kind of you know weirded out by it, but after two or three uh, practice tests, you'll you'll get a sense for these. And look at this question. It says yes, yes, no, no. Well, we don't want no in this one because it does it is consistent with the research of predicting predictions because there's more blue crickets and there's our big one for the blue. Two is G. Number three was kind of tricky. I almost said it was 300, but then I said, well, it's the same 100 wild spiders and then the different 100 um, lab-grown spiders, so it's 200 total. And you do have to go into the reading for those. Number four, it is H, the species of prey other than domesticus, because you want a different species of prey. Different species of different other than. You could just, you don't have to know anything about the question, just read the question, different species, different species other than. A domesticus, A domesticus. Okay, number five. Uh, the plots are the different kinds of colors, so it's the particular color, not the total number. So it's either gotta be C or D, and then you go, well, they were wild in figure one, they were lab rays in, in experiment three, so it's gotta be D. Then number six, this is a wasn't the reading. It's like, you have to know that when you name organisms, I think it's the, it's the Linnaeus system. They want the genus species. So it's genus species, both one and two. Then number seven, it's like, what do you think was gonna happen for the, if they've, if they've been caged, you'd think there'd be fewer crickets. The data kind of shows that. Experiment one and experiment two, they're captive, they were less in experiment two. So I think that makes sense just by common sense. If you're lab grown and captive, you're gonna be slower than a wild grown spider, natural selection. Okay, pause this and I'm gonna let you look at passage two. Okay, now that you've looked at that for a moment, there's a couple of things I'm gonna look at. Okay, so all these series of trials, there's 44 total trials. That's gonna be a question there. And have you noticed that the NaOH and KOH using the same number here the 1.5, the 1.5, the KOH is higher. So when you have, and what are the, what are the trends here? Increasing the microwave time increases the, the percent of oil converted to biodiesel fuel, and the KOH is higher too. So increased time and KOH is a higher, uh, has an effect on that too. Okay, so number eight, I'll let you go back and read through those, um, those uh, steps again in the experiment. Number five was adding ice a cold slows down the reaction if you've taken chemistry you kind of know increasing the rate of reaction increasing the kinetic energy raising the temperature raises a reaction rate okay number nine they want the lowest you can actually look at the data but just by my introduction i know koh was higher so mark out the koh and the, and the lower time so it's neoh with lower time and if you actually go look at the data t -t 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 you can take the time, but I looked at my trend and knew the NaOH and lower time. That's the lowest, not the highest. Okay, number 10. There were sometimes higher and lower, depending on, um, it's sometimes higher, sometimes lower. There's not a direct trend there. 
Okay, number 13. I think I said there were 44 trials, so you can mark off the 11s right there. And if you go back through the reading, there's 80 milliliters of methanol in each uh, sample, so it's 44 times 80. Uh, number 12, the identity catalyst is a different traits from 25 and 33. And then number 13, the KOH is faster, so it increased only in this time. As the microwave time increased, it increased only. And then number 14, it's kind of a simple math problem. Like, well, I can't use a calculator on this test. Well, you don't have to use a calculator. Just move the decimal twice. So 1%, 0.01 times 82 is 0 0.82, which is close to 0.8. So it's a very simple math problem. Okay, so then I'll pause a moment here to read passage 3 if you haven't taken this test. Beep, beep, beep. Beep. Okay, so I'm going to go through here and just say, hey, um, things that are, you know, the when you heat something, it's cold outside. So the Alaska, AK, is highest on heating days. And guess what? Miami and Dallas are hot. And L.A. kind of is. But you need a lot of cooling days. But L.A. is on the coast. So southern needs more cooling days and northern needs more heating days. So I'm going to look at this trend line, and you're going to see a slight decrease. And this one is pretty similar. So the HDD trend line, it goes down, has a negative slope. And I'm going to look for highs and lows. There's a low in the year 1992, and there's a high in the year 1996. So I'm just looking for two of those kind of things, and I bet it's question 15. So there it is. No, the minimum HDD is 1996, and the minimum CDD, the max C HDD is in 96, and the min CDD is in 92. They're always looking for min and max trend lines. Number 16, if you look at the table, the CDD for HDD is 4740 to 452 is a 10 to 1 ratio, roughly. Number 17, based on table 1, from 40 to 50, HD was always greater than 2500. That's just looking through the data. And I'll let you go back and look at that for a moment. Number 18, uh, when you have a TD of 65, looking at the formula, it's this 65 minus that and that minus 65. Both of them are zero. I'm like, uh, that's just simple math. I cannot miss those kind of problems. They're too easy. Number 19, if you graph the CDD for the cities, Miami had the highest. The southernmost had more cooling days because it's hot in Miami. Okay, I'll tell you a little story. We were supposed, my daughter graduated from high school. We were supposed to go to Florida in June during COVID. And I'm like, oh, we didn't get to, didn't get to go to Florida. So the way I'm looking at it, trying to find a positive, we just saved $6,000 this year. And we're going to do it next year, I think. So anyway, number 19 is A. And number 20, um, when that we said that trend line for HDD is going down. So if it's 65 minus TD... As the HD goes down, the TD goes up, so it increased only over this 26-year period. Okay, here is passage 4. I'm going to give you a moment to Let's see if it'll shrink and you can see it all. There we go. Beep, 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 beep. There we go. Okay, not very good. Pause, maybe. But there's an amoeba, intamoeba, histolica can infect human digestive system. So I'm going to look at this data before I do anything else. Uh, what goes down is the percent survival. When you add human milk, it kills things. And the same thing here, the non-casein protein has per lowest percent survival. So I guarantee you the highest and the lowest will be a question. And I think it's number 21. There it is. In experiment two, the, the fewest surviving was the non-casein proteins. That's these right here. That's the uh, fewest. Number 22, um, all three have one-third milk, so all three incubation times. Then 23, there is no change for the NMs, which is um, the percent survival of the stolica containing lipids. Let me go back. So the lipids was this 80, 80, and 80. There's basically no change over time, 80%. And then 24, it says is and is and does and does. And it, so the, the 1 to 3 doesn't mark those off. It's the percent survival, which is J. In 25, noticed 
that it says that are not stained by trip tripen blue okay they are st the dead ones are stained so the living ones are not so it says the ones that are stained the dead are blue the other ones survive so if it's 80 percent survived 20 are dead okay they they always ask it opposite and they mention that with uh, several in several times several places on this test number 20 c 26 sorry number 26 in experiment two they want human milk and then 27 you have to know that there's a little bit of hard science that amoeba are unicellular and it's a eukaryote so it does have a nucleus what is a prokaryote it is bacteria and archaebacteria so if it only has just a, a dna loop so they do respond okay pause again shrink this There we go. Okay, now I'm going get, to get back up here. This is not a, a graph. This is a picture. And it says student one, student two, and student three. And I'm going to pick out the major uh, things about each student. So this person says electric fields attract each other when they're opposite, well, only when anti-parallel. So that's talking about fields. Student two is talking about the negative charges, the electrons, and each current generates a magnetic field. And then number three, it's actually wrong. It says the switch is controlled by the signs and positive in X and negative in Y. Well, if that were true, they would attract. But this is, this is wrong, but this is what they say. Regardless of whether they are at rest or in motion, charges of like signs attract. No, opposites attract. So student three is wrong, but just remember they're wrong, and they're going to ask you questions about why they're wrong. So number 28. That we just said that, which is scientifically inaccurate. Charges of like signs attract each other. No, charges of like repel. So that's why that is wrong. Okay, number 29, it's the particles, electrons are negative. Number 30, if, if it's correct, then things in motion creates mag magnetism, magnetic force, which is actually true. And then 31, student one, would they be parallel or anti? Anti because they're opposite. And then number 32, these are wrong. So if they're positive, they would really, um, they're consistent with both figure two and students threes. You know, the positives should repel, not attract. So that's wrong, but that's why it's wrong, because it's student three. And then number 33 is A, student one versus student two. It's um, A, student one is fields and student two is a ions, particles. And then the, the number 34, a compass needle would be deflected by a magnetic field. And you kind of have to know by history of just you being in North America, you know that compasses work by magnetism. Okay, here's passage number six, and this is the last one. So I'm going to pause this one, and you can sh I'll shrink it so you can see it all. Beep, beep, beep. Okay, this is the last passage, and I thought, wow, this is so simple. And it really is simple. This is a direct relationship. So in figure one, the relative humidity has higher, more water vapor pressure. Duh! If you have more water, you have more humidity. It's a direct relationship. Okay, that's so simple. Number two, um, when you have um, higher water, water vapor pressure, it's an inver inverse relationship of air density. And then the question, figure three is going to be a, it's, it's a more complicated graph, but do you see there's three chemicals on here? And it's relative humidity, which relates to this graph over here. So graph three and graph, figure three and figure one are going to be related. And then air density has to do with some stuff too. So it's going to be percent by mass of compound and solution. This is the different solute, sulfuric acid, calcium chloride, and sodium hydroxide, a base, an acid, and a salt which if you had chemistry, you kind of recognize those. And I'm a chemistry teacher, so I go ahead and say that, even though it's not important to the problem. So number three, uh, based on figures one and two, as RH increases, um, air density decreases only. That's figure two. It's an inverse relationship. Very uh, easy problem there. Figure, okay, the problem 36 is in figure two. It's 1172. Well, I'm like, 1172 is way over here. It's off the chart, so they want you to extrapolate. And I'm going to say, hmm, 
It's more than 24, but it's less than 3, so 2,700 pascals, or 2.7 kilopascals. Sounds familiar. Extend the graph. So it's just taking the graph and going a little bit further. I'm going to have to flip back on some of these because they're harder. Number 37, it says if pure water, then it's 100% relative humidity. I can't even, I can't even on this one. So figure three, if it's percent by mass of compound, if the solute is zero, then it's 100% relative humidity. Duh. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's a duh question. Number two, based on figure two, so you want the, you want it more dense, 1,000 pascals. So that's on figure two. And then uh, problem 39, a 30% by mass of sulfuric acid. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to go to 35%, 35% sulfuric acid, and there is 70% relative humidity. So we're going to take that 70% relative humidity, go on the other graph, and see where what density would be. So... 70% relative humidity, which will be about, on this graph, 2,100 pascals. 2,100 pascals is about right here. So it's like 1,174 to 1,176. I'm going to say 1,175. Oh, there it is. So this is question number 39. I had to go to three graphs to find that. They were simple steps, but it took time. And had you saved time and the other passages, you would have got to this question. And this is very, looking back, it's like, gee, this isn't that hard. No, it's not. But it's difficult in a 35-minute test. That's why it's hard. So the quicker you can see this, the higher your score is going to be. And then uh, two 20% by mass solutions, the sulfuric acid is on the higher relative humidity because sulfuric acid is up here higher on the relative humidity scale, no matter any other variable. So yes, higher from H2SO4. So I marked off the no-no and went to the yes-yes, because sulfuric acid is the highest one. Okay, that is in a nutshell the BO4 science test, and I'll let you go back and rewind if you want to see parts of this. Thanks.